Foley was always very um, uh, involved in pro bono uh, work, um, uh, particularly starting in the, in the late 60s, early 70s with the, the um, Boston School case. The firm was handling what I feel was its most important case ever, uh, which was the Boston School desegregation case, where the firm represented on a pro bono basis the uh, plaintiffs, the families who uh, filed a suit in federal court to deseg desegregate the uh, Boston uh, public schools. It was born out of um, the busing desegregation case where, where Foley, Hoag, and Elliott represented the plaintiffs. At the end of that trial, the court awarded the firm uh, legal fees that weren't expected, and the firm took those fees and created the foundation. We give money to organizations to permit them to do something that they might not otherwise have the resources to do. One of the things that is unique about the uh, Foley Hoag Foundation is that we basically, uh, through the foundation, uh, make use of um, uh, uh, associates and other staff who have uh, a, a personal interest in the work that the foundation does. Uh, the process, as with the case, as is the case with any foundation, is one that uh, invites um, applications, grant applications from uh, a whole host of nonprofit programs um, that are uh, uh, involved directly in the community. The way that the foundation uh, operates uh, uh, this mechanism is by um, permitting um, and relying on um, associates and other staff to go out and do that actual vetting of uh, uh, potential grantees. Uh, it is remarkable um, and has been remarkable in my mind that uh, associates do that uh, here at uh, the firm um, by uh, devoting their personal time. There's been uh, no, no uh, dearth of of involvement and uh, participation from the associates. She asked about what the foundation does. We really do three things. Our core mission involves providing grants to grantees in two rounds done each year. We also have an awareness program where we bring speakers in to the firm, either here or in Boston, to speak about issues that are core to our mission. And we team with the law firm Foley Hoag to provide pro bono assistance to worthy grantees. And in the last three years, and expanded now to the Washington, D.C. area as well, they're involved in uh, a host of nonprofit programs that uh, promote, um, uh, again, diversity, inclusion, and equality um, in um, any and all of its forms. Um, that um, uh, is a um, very unique um, uh, undertaking for this firm because it is still, to this day, one of the very few private foundations that is sponsored by a private law firm uh, in the country. Uh, and that is something that uh, uh, we all are very proud of. When uh, I first started, uh, we really didn't have departments, and people thought having departments at a firm was not a good idea because there shouldn't be specialization. But then they realized that more and more lawyers were focused on particular areas of practice, and so we started having areas of practice. Um, I uh, wound up going into the uh, real estate area of practice, later on known as the real estate department. It, it, was, it was national. I mean, there was, um, we had transactions in California, in Denver, Florida. Um, uh, we bought hotels, the Ritz-Carlton hotels in New York and Washington, D.C. Well, the environmental was, uh arose because of the passage of environmental laws that were passed, I believe, in the Nixon administration. Lori Burt uh, had really founded the environmental practice here, and uh, she was uh, an important senior attorney and somebody I would always go to for strategic advice. The law firm did not have an environmental practice. They had been involved in some major high-profile environmental cases, including the W.R. Grace case in Woburn, which later became the subject of Civil Action, the book and the movie, um, but they none of the firms had an environmental practice. They usually were um, good litigators that were put on this thing called an environmental case. I wanted to start an environmental practice, so that was sort of my ambition, my mission, uh, what I wanted to do. Um, and that was both federal and state, um, because the federal laws, environmental laws, look sort of complicated but many of the federal programs are delegated to the state 
So you're still doing federal law, but the state is, is um, enforcing that. The practice did start as more regional, I would say New England, but quickly expanded on a national and international scope. One of the biggest high-profile cases that we had early on was the defense of, of the Boston Harbor cleanup. And they had been sued by an, the Environmental Protection Agency. Um, the state had also been sued, and a number of environmental groups had also all joined the suit for cleaning up Boston Harbor. In uh, the early 1980s, Boston Harbor was one of the dirtiest places you would um, ever care to see. Claims were brought against the Commonwealth, and we had the privilege of representing and continue to represent the Massachusetts Water Resources Authority, um, both in the, the Harbor case, which led to the construction of um, a modern wastewater treatment plant, uh, which in turn, I think, really enabled the development of the seaport area where we sit today, which is the epicenter of new development in Boston. Foley HOAG uh, has been fortunate enough to participate in some of the most important international environmental law cases, um, representing Ecuador in a case that it brought against Colombia, representing Uruguay in a case brought by Argentina, and Nicaragua uh, in a case against Costa Rica. Building the environmental practice at Foley was, I think, one of the most gratifying things that I ever did. I think quickly it became apparent to me that um, environmental law is, is a, requires a very public persona. It requires a lot of confidence. You are dealing with government and private sector and public sector and often technology and science. It's very interdisciplinary. And uh, so you cannot do that as a clone of anyone. <laughs> you really need your own persona. And so I really urged uh, all of my associates and the team that I was building and later young partners to really take on as much responsibility as they could. And that meant really also giving them credit where they uh, were succeeding and also credit financially for handling clients uh, or helping get clients. Eventually, the CAB went out of business and Northeast Airlines was acquired by Delta, so we no longer had that client, and even if we had, there was no CAB anymore. Um, so we, we, we didn't want to close the Washington office. We wanted to keep it uh, operating, and when Senator Paul Songus came to Foley, he, he felt it was very important. Actually, I joined the firm um, as, uh, back in 1985 at which time um, former U.S. Senator Paul Songas had um, uh, left the Senate and uh, joined the firm to um, uh, establish a practice that would uh, operate in certainly in large part out of Washington, D.C. I was part of a group that came from another firm altogether, uh, a, a group that was involved in corporate finance and tax related uh, uh, practice. And we were um, recruited by the firm to complement the uh, practice that uh, Senator Paul Songus was going to be developing. Uh, it, it brought about a real need for a, a D.C. presence for the firm. I don't necessarily think that the legislative practice that uh, Senator Songus was about to undertake, uh, nor the, uh, uh, the corporate uh, finance and uh, tax practice that we were involved in, were necessarily um, uh, uh, compatible with uh, any uh, existing practice in our Boston office at that time. They were both viewed as um, uh, new practices for the firm, not to mention uh, a new um, foray into um, the uh, developing a, a DC uh, presence for the firm altogether. When I look around at the uh, practice that uh, we have in the Washington DC office now, there are uh, practices that have really grown out of a desire by a number of the uh, a number of uh, uh, partners that I've worked with over the years in the uh, in the firm to expand their practices here. Uh, the uh, we have now, for example, a um, uh, health uh, health care and life sciences practice. Uh, that is because there were uh, a number of people. Uh, a, the name of uh, Nick Littlefield uh, uh, comes to mind of one of the partners here who uh, had a vision of expanding uh, his health care and life sciences practice beyond uh, the uh, New England New England area. There is a uh, uh, food and drug um, administration type of practice here now that is very much the direct outgrowth 
of, of uh, again, uh, partners in uh, the, um, uh, uh, the Boston office who had a uh, desire to develop that particular component. I think at one point we got the opportunity to acquire a smallish Washington law firm that specialized in international arbitration and similar proceedings, and that was headed by Paul Reichler. The firm I was with uh, before joining Foley uh, was Reichler, Milton, and Medell, uh, a firm headed by Paul Reichler. We were devoted to representing foreign sovereigns. I won't say that that was every, every client that we had was a foreign sovereign, but the overwhelming majority. Uh, we represented them in international disputes and in the U.S. courts, and also transactions like privatizations and the law reform that went along with it. When Reichler, Milton, and Adele decided to look, uh, in late 1997, decided to look to see if there were a larger law firm uh, with which we would feel comfortable, uh, we really wondered whether that was even possible to find. And it was an incredible serendipity that at the same time, Foley Hogue had decided to beef up its Washington, D.C. office. And uh, it was really a marriage made in heaven. It really took us about not even five months to uh, interview, to talk to people, to negotiate the terms of the merger. Uh, we started in about mid to late January, and by June 1st of 98, we became part of Foley Ho. The combination of our, uh, here are 12 lawyers who, uh, fortunately, they considered us very good lawyers, uh, and uh, uh, who, who had, a, ha had a Washington presence, knew the Washington market, or at least relevant aspects of it, and had a, a very interesting um, international practice, I think this attracted us to them. We really had no problems whatsoever in the merger. It was harmonious throughout. There was magic in the personalities involved in Reichler, Milton, and Medell's merger into Foley Hogue. I think Barry White, Peter Rosenblum, some other uh, uh, leaders in the firm at the time could see uh, they were the type of people who were open to change, open to newness, open to growth in the firm. And at the same time, the Reichler, Milton, and Medell people were very open to new possibilities in representing clients. Barry was the, the biggest driver of making uh, it happen. Barry was a real visionary to see that the addition of an international practice a truly international practice to Foley Hogue would be of great benefit to the firm and really open up new fields for the firm. To being more than a regional law firm, to be more than a top or if not the top law firm in New England, but to expanding the firm's reach. And that took a lot of open-mindedness on the part of the leaders on both sides. The Armadillo is a litigation department tradition. If you are the last person to show up on the first day of work for your class, then you inherit the Armadillo. It used to be both litigators and corporate lawyers. There was a period of time where a corporate lawyer put it in her closet um, in, in the office and because she was so terrified of it and when it got to a litigator we're like we're not giving it to those corporate lawyers again. I only had to wait a week before someone else arrived who was newer than me. I've known associates who've had that armadillo for longer than they should have had. I was a, I was a caretaker of the armadillo for a year um, although I was horrified when it was first appeared on my desk. The armadillo is about the size of a bread box. Is it real? It's an actual armadillo. Um, I assume it was run over at some point in Texas in the 80s. There's a ribbon around its tail. I think the armadillo now has a beanie baby child. I'd like to know where it is. Uh, if I see the armadillo, I'll let you know.
the term intellectual property practice, um, I, I, I don't recall hearing it at all back then. Um, I went to Harvard Law School and there were no courses in intellectual property law. I remember there was one course you could take in copyright law with Ben Kaplan. Uh, that was about the closest that they came to intellectual property law. And I think that people thought of it more as patent law. That is, there was a patent practice and that was done by other law firms and it was taught by other law schools. They, Harvard, I think, thought of it too much as, a tr as kind of a trade or something. And uh, so, so they didn't sort of stoop to the level of this uh, kind of geeky science um, practice. I think a lot of our practices have really developed um, substantially since the time um, that I started at Foley. Certainly the patent litigation practice has grown tremendously. Um, you know, we didn't even have an IP group when I joined the firm. Uh, so what happened really is in the 19, late 1980s into the 1990s, a number of general practice firms started saying, well, we could handle those cases. They're big cases. And um, a, a lot of big general practice firms had uh, grown their litigation practices based on antitrust litigation. And antitrust litigation started to dry up. So you had a lot of lawyers who knew a lot about marketplace issues and complicated competition situations, which actually had quite a lot to do with patent damages as well. So they started thinking they could do them. So it was a good five to seven years after I arrived here when finally the firm management decided that it made sense to have the prosecutors and the litigators who were focused on patent work in the same department. The lawyers almost never asked for a jury. So they, they thought it was a highly technical matter and they presented it to judges. Once some of the general practice firms got involved and, um, and more traditional trial lawyers, very experienced trial lawyers got involved, they started saying, well, we could try this to a jury. And all of a sudden there got to be some huge jury awards in patent cases. And we have to have a really deep understanding of the science, but we also have to be able to explain it to judges and juries. So in a lot of ways, we're, we're the translators and we have a really deep bench team of PhD scientists who join our litigation teams who help us kind of bridge the gap. One of the um, uh, more recent practices that has uh, uh, grown and developed at the firm is our uh, corporate social responsibility practice, uh, for which uh, Gare Smith, our partner, is, is, uh, uh, has been principally responsible. Um, uh, Gare describes that practice as a, um, as a risk management based practice which takes into account uh, cultural um, as well as legal um, uh, considerations at, uh, and uh, um, restrictions, uh, both here in the U.S. and often um, uh, uh, abroad. The D.C. office has several outstanding practice areas. Of course, the international litigation arbitration practice, which we've been talking about. We've expanded our already outstanding white-collar crime practice in our Boston office to uh, the uh, DC office. We just had two uh, partners joining us who are just previous U.S. district attorneys and it, it's really an excellent expansion into that space. A lot of people sometimes ask you what it's like to move from being a federal prosecutor to being a white collar defense attorney. I don't always wear white shirts. I also wear blue shirts and I wear striped shirts. But I will tell you that I always wear button down shirts. I don't wear a bow tie. I only wear, I do not wear a bow tie, unless I'm wearing a tuxedo. A major event in the firm was the change in management of the firm. If you go way back and go back, let's say, before 1980, the law firm was managed by, uh, I think, five people who were called managing partners. They were self-selected. Firm governance changed in 1982. We went from a much more autocratic, um, centralized management structure where there was a single managing partner or managing partners who just served for as, you know, as ever long as they liked. Um, to a much more democratic system. There's a group of younger partners, um, Barry White, Bob Birnbaum, Peter Rosenblum, John Patterson, Dave Ellis, Peter Coogan, um, all people I consider my own mentors uh, over the years. 
but I think they decided that they wanted more of a say in firm governance. I think people thought that it was time to transition to a different form of governance. And Hans Loser led the effort. I turned out to be the chairman of the committee and we uh, revised the whole management structure of the firm. Under that agreement, the equity partners vote one person, one vote uh, for a uh, executive committee. They run the firm kind of like the board of directors runs a corporation. The committee was formed and Barry was the chair, which is why it was called the White Commission or the White Committee. And out of that came the modern partnership agreement, the one that we still have to this day. We have a um, rotating executive committee where you serve term limits. You can't serve more than eight years. We have this concept we don't ha do not have permanent management. Um, management is expected also to maintain their practices. So as co-managing partner, you know, I also continue to practice and, and all my predecessors have. So we're really in the trenches. We understand what it is to practice law day to day. We understand what the challenges that our partners face. The firm already had an executive committee, so that hasn't changed since the time that I've been here. I think what has changed is there's been more autonomy given to, given to departments. We have regular department chair meetings. Departments are expected to do more than I think um, they did before. I think we've gotten better at managing. This is a place that has a lot of independent people. Uh, partners particularly like to do their own thing, which for the most part is great, uh, but I think we have put more management on, um, on top of that over the last 29 years. There had never been a woman on the executive committee. When I first considered uh, putting my hat in the ring for executive committee, people did not run for executive committee. You sort of, you either, the only way that you made, you sort of nominated yourself by not taking your name off a list. You were on the list, otherwise you had to be crossed off the list. So it was a very interesting uh, canvassing uh, of uh, new candidates. Um, but I did throw my hat in the ring um, because I felt very strongly that the firm uh, needed to support new areas of practice, um, needed to support its younger lawyers, needed to, there were a number of, of issues that I thought that the firm would, would make the firm stronger um, in bringing up uh, the next generation of lawyers. So I did throw my hat in the ring and uh, was uh, elected by my peers and um, served for uh, one four-year term in the late 90s. You know, as co-managing partner, it, we were never full-time management. We all had to maintain our practices. And so during the period of time when I was on the executive committee and, and for those seven years as co-managing partner, um, I was uh, always scrambling to keep up with my clients. So, you know, when I came here, it, it was, you know, in addition to people like Barry White, for example, the firm had had a, a female managing partner, Michelle Widom. It was pretty amazing uh, to me at that time. I, I was uh, committed to making sure that the young women of the firm got the s assistance that they needed to spend the time with their newborn that they wanted to spend and then had um, whatever accommodations in their work schedule that they needed after they came back to work. And some people came back full time, some people came back three quarters time, but that was something that we had to invent. And uh, so we, we spent a lot of effort on making sure that that worked for, for women. And fathers too, by the way. Many of them, were, they were literally relieved that the firm realized that that was important to them as well. The 19, December 31st, 1969 partnership agreement, so it was clearly not the first. Um, it is a whopping three pages. Now our partnership agreement runs to about 20 pages. So it's, I think that collegiality um, that's embedded in that is really, in the partnership agreement, has really served the firm well because our partners feel like they have a stake in the firm. They too can run for management, they, they too can get involved, and, and I think that's served us really well. And moving to the seaport was uh, absolutely a frontline decision that I was engaged in while I was on the executive committee. Real estate was going right through the roof, commercial real estate, in the 
financial district, the old financial district. So we had to make a decision on potentially moving or staying in one post office square. We had two choices, to move into the Prudential Center area or to come down to the seaport. And I remember discussing with a lot of partners and people were upset that we were considering the seaport. There was nothing here. The decision to move down here was not uh, an easy one. So the big dig was underway. We still had the raised central artery, which created a barrier between the financial district and this area. So this area was pretty um, barren. Uh, there was not much down here. There was no place to go. You couldn't, there was no grocery store, there was no, um, uh, no drug store. There was nothing here. There, and when I say there was nothing here, there was nothing here. The convention center was being built next door. Uh, one of our partners, Gloria Larson, was the chair of the convention board. So Gloria Larson came here after a term of service and serving in two cabinet uh, positions for Governor Weld. Uh, she was the chairman of the convention center. Uh, authority, and she uh, played a very prominent role in turning the Convention Center uh, Authority from a, um, a dumping ground of South Boston politicians to being a professionally run organization. And as uh, was, I would say, typical of Foley in many regards, uh, the final decision was made by vote. Went around the table, everyone voted on uh, which uh, site they thought was the best, uh, and and it did turn out that it, in the end, was a consensus. Uh, some people may have felt we should go to the back bay, others felt strongly to come here, but in the end, it really was a consensus to come down here. We had, I was there on the committee from 1996 to 2000, and we pretty much moved by 2002. So there was a committee that was assembled that was called the Space Committee. There was Barry White, um, who was also a managing partner. Mark Clark was another one of our partners. Um, Mark approach things from a different standpoint. He was more interested in what every decision that we made, how it would impact everybody on every level. So he was more the really wanting to understand it, being compassionate. Paul Murphy was the administrative partner on the executive committee. His responsibility was to keep us moving and that was a big responsibility. We had two partners, Susan Montgomery and um, Phil Burling. So Susan was prior to law life, she was uh, a graduate of the Rhode Island School of Design. Um, and Phil Burling also really enjoyed um, everything of the developing and the furniture and the finishes. Um, and he actually was involved with the choosing and placement of every piece of art in the seaport. And there was Paul Norton, who was our executive director. Uh, his role was to keep everything on time and on budget. He did a great job with that. Uh, Frank Bailey was our director of IT. Um, he was to make sure that we had the technology and the infrastructure that we needed for the new building. Um, and actually this project landed him on the cover of a cabling magazine, if there is such a thing. Um, so he was on the cover of that for our CAT6 uh, infrastructure cabling. The move was Memorial Day weekend, 2002. We closed fully at noon and it was a very hard close, everybody was gone. Um, we started loading up trucks and there was a parade from one post office square to Seaport West that started probably mid-afternoon on that Friday and continued for about 72 hours. I became involved with the, uh, the move to the seaport for a number of reasons. First, it, it made sense that I should be involved because of my real estate background. Uh, second, it made sense that I should be involved because I believe I was the administrative partner at that time, or at least early on in terms of our, our move to the seaport. There was a major trend at that time also of firms having their own cafeteria. And that was a major controversy of whether or not we would or we would not. But the idea of moving out here where there were no restaurants or anything else, um, the having a cafeteria was really an imperative. Um, and it turned out to be very successful. I do remember the first time we crossed the channel and we came across the channel and thought, oh, this isn't too bad, it's still close to Boston. And then we just kept on walking past the empty parking lots and it felt like a wasteland. And a number of us thought, what have we done? How are we gonna get through this 10-year lease? Well, the 10-year lease has come and gone and we've going through another lease and it's now an amazing place to be. I was on the team of moving uh, everybody. We were all had different assignments 
and one of the girls who worked in the facilities department had been over here and spent hours labeling all the file drawers according to a color-coded map of which attorneys were going to have what file space in here and we discovered uh, that night that the cleaning people who were trying to get the space ready for us thought they were being helpful and they took all the labels off so myself and another co-worker were given the task of putting them all back on. We had uh, maps on every off uh, in every elevator lobby. You are here. People knew their office numbers and locations. Some attorneys had come over, the staff had not. Um, we actually had uh, ambassadors on each floor that kind of directed people to the, to the office numbers. Uh, we had a welcome breakfast and actually Mayor Menino came because it was very big for us to be here in the seaport. Um, we offered welcome lunches for every floor because basically we displaced everybody. We had offered uh, manicures for all of the women who had been involved with the move because moving is a lot of work. None of us, I think, could have predicted just how vibrant it would be down here and what an exciting place it would be for a law firm.